You know, it's hard to believe it's been eight months since my last Commodore Plus 4 user's manual chapter, which was entitled Chapter 8, Making Sound and Music on the Plus 4. Well, finally, eight months later, we are going to cover the last half of the user's guide. That's right. Chapters 1 through 8 was only about 50% of the user's guide. The back half is called the encyclopedia, and there's a lot of meaty stuff in there. We are going to do the whole thing in this one video. We're going to run through the encyclopedia. Obviously, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but I am going to hit the highlights of what you need to know, the items that are in the encyclopedia that can make your Commodore Plus 4 user's experience more pleasurable. So I would recommend you grab a cup of tea, grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and while you're at it, make sure you check out the companion blog post that's also available for this video. Remember those chapter markers down below so that you can jump around. And finally, don't forget that Commodore.d81 disk image that I've included that includes all all the programs from the manual, the disc Commodore should have included, as well as a few extras of mine that I've thrown in to help explain some concepts, which will be a few in this chapter. Again, kick back, find you a hot drink, and let's get started on the Commodore Plus 4 User's Guide Encyclopedia. All right, as I mentioned, I have a disk image available. I am going to install that into my Pi 1541 right here. Then we're gonna plug in power, USB power to our Pi 1541. And you'll see our menu pops up. So I'm going to scroll down to retro combs, hit enter, and I'm going to mount the disk image right there. Hey, before we get started, can I ask you to do something? I want you to go down below. I want you to like, I want you to subscribe. I want you to hit those alerts. And I want you to make sure that you do the things that these people are doing right here, my new producers, which is going to buy me a coffee and either supporting the channel or becoming a member. I've got these really fun Commodore specific membership levels. So be sure and go check out that page. Also, don't forget, this video is part of a series on the Commodore Plus 4 User's Guide. Check out stephencombs.com slash plus four to see the remaining videos or to get caught up. And remember to share this series with those plus four or C16 enthusiasts you know. The encyclopedia covers every single command in basic 3.5. Now that would be a lengthy video and we've covered the majority of them in chapters one through eight. However, today what I'm going to do is cover a few of those commands that deserve a little bit more detail. Now this section begins with a command and statement format and you can see here it shows you the basic commands and statements and the parts of the commands and statements you must type or may or may not need. Now what I've done is this is, this is pretty lengthy as you can see it goes over a couple pages. In the companion blog post, I have shortened that to include just a few things that you need. So if you want a very quick reference to each of the commands and what all those differing characters mean, we can do that. For instance, here's the example code for deload or the example command for deload. Of course, the command is deload. You have your program name enclosed by quotation marks. But what is this stuff over here? Well, the D over here, the D number, is the option for the drive. And you can see it's looking specifically for a number. And U is the unit that can be specified, for instance, if you have a dual drives, and again, it's requesting a number. But there are some other things that it will ask for in the command. For instance, some additional command conventions include the vertical bar, which allows you to select from a list of limited arguments. So you'll see that list in the user's guide if those are available. You also have the ellipses here, which is an argument can be used more than once. That means you can just stack them on there. Some, some options do have that capability. And then you have the parentheses, and this argument must include 
That means that anything in within the parentheses must be included in that command. So that's very valuable to know as you look through each of the commands in the encyclopedia. You can see they have all of those conventions in there and it can get a little confusing if you don't know what all of that means. So that's just a succinct way to help you navigate through the encyclopedia of basic commands and functions. Okay, there are a few commands I wanna show from the command encyclopedia that uh, deserve a little bit of attention. The first one is auto. So I'm going to type auto and I'm going to type 10. And what I want you to notice is as I'm typing commands or lines of code, let's go ahead and put a number in here. Let's call this 10 and I hit enter, watch what happens. It automatically types the next line for me which would be 20, so it's in increments of 10. Now I can change this, if I wanna make this five, I can hit enter, then if I come down here and hit enter again, you'll notice that it's now 15. So that is the auto command, very handy when you're typing in basic. Now I'm gonna come back up here and I'm gonna go ahead and type in zero and hit enter and then uh, you'll notice nothing happens at that point, right? Now another thing is, as I mentioned, we do have a comprehensive companion disc for this series. There's a lot of stuff on there, but you'll notice uh, it's kind of hard to find what you're looking for. Luckily, you have someone who labeled all these by chapter or by encyclopedia. So let's say you just want to see the files in the encyclopedia. Well, you can type EN followed by the wildcard, which is an asterisk, hit enter, and you'll see that that will load right up. If you are interested, let's say in chapters four, you can come up here, type 04. Oh, and by the way, you don't need uh, that close quotations at the end, just as a little save time tip for you. And there you go, there are all of the commands or all of the programs from chapter four. So that's really handy. The other command that you have that's very handy is one called scratch. And I'm gonna stay away from that, but before in, uh, earlier Commodores on 1541s. It was uh, uh, to, to erase files or to replace files. It was this whole series of open and close commands and it was quite confusing and complicated. Now, to delete a file, you can simply hit scratch followed by the name of the file and it will scratch that file from your 1541. It's very, very handy. I love it on uh, the Commodore Plus 4. Now, another one we're gonna talk about is a command called monitor. And I am not gonna spend a lot of time right now talking about it, but that enters our machine language monitor. We've got, I've got a little bit of surprise for you in the future me as I'm talking about the monitor or the Tedmon. So make sure you stay in, or if you just can't wait, jump right down using those chapter uh, uh, markers down below and you can jump right to the Tedmon. Now this next one I really like, it's called Tron. No, not that Tron. <laughs> Hey, 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 it's the big master control program everybody's been talking about. However, there's also another command called trough. So would that be Tron's misunderstood brother? I still do not understand why you want to break into the system. But in the world of Commodore computing, we can do some very interesting things with that. Let me load a program and show you what I mean. So I've loaded a program called trap. And trap works with Tron. Tron is trap on or trap off or trough. So how does this work? Well, if we look through these lines, 10, we've turned on trace. 20, we're sending a trap to line 50, which means if there's an error, jump to line 50 for that error. And then what we've done is in line 50, I've created an error message, which we'll talk about here in just a second. We go to 30, print retro combs. 40, we go to 20, and then on 50, let's talk through that here just a minute. This is the neat thing about the trap and Tron, but there's also this error message string, this ERR string slash a number, which comes from the trap up here, submits it in there, and then it tells us what that error message is. So it's a great way to find out what error messages are in your program. Now let's run this and kind of see what happens here. Now you'll notice on the left over here, and I'm going to go ahead and break this right here so you can see, this tells us what line is running. So 40 to 20 to 30, and then it prints retro combs. Let's go ahead and list that again so you can see that in action. We come up here, it's gonna go 30, prints retro combs. It's gonna to go to 40, 
goes back to 20, which is the trap back on. So you'll see it's just a series of loops all the way up here until we get a break in the code. In my case, I hit run stop and we got error break in line 50. So what it did is it stopped that loop, came down here, said error. What kind of error is it right here? It was a break in line error. And what line was it in? Well, it was in line 30. So that's where the, the program broke when I hit run stop. Okay, let's take a look at another concept called pixel cursor. Now, unlike this cursor, which is the character cursor that we can kind of move around on screen, there's another concept called the pixel cursor or PC that lets us move a, an invisible pixel around on the graphic screen. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, not only does it move this position around, it also allows us to use relative coordinates when creating graphics. I did not spend a lot of time on this command or this concept in the graphics chapter. And I wanna cover that now. Now I've done this by way of a program. So let me go ahead and load that program for you. Let's go ahead and list the program and talk about what it does and then we'll run it so that you can see the advantages of using pixel cursors. So first of all, we set our color and uh, we're setting our screen, we're setting our background, we're setting our graphic screen to two with a color of white to draw. We're also now getting into this command called locate. Locate is the command that sets your pixel cursor. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, move your pixel cursor to 120 pixels by 100 pixels. So we're going to move it over this way and down, right? And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use that pixel cursor concept of relative coordinates to draw a line. And I'm going to draw the line in white that starts at plus zero comma zero. Now, that normally would be in the upper left-hand side of the screen, right? But it's not going to because I have moved the cursor from that default of 0, 0 down to 120 by 100. And this plus says make it relative to the last position, which is right here. Then I'm doing something really kind of cool. And what I'm doing is I am creating a triangle using angles. So I'm going to create the first leg of the triangle at 50 units at 45 degrees to 50 units at 135 degrees, and then at 70 units at 270 degrees. Fix that colon there to a semicolon. And then what I wanna do is create a circle that is positioned, its center point is positioned at the last known location of the pixel cursor, which was right here. So let's go ahead and run the program and see what happens. And you can see that we have, that's drawn and we have our triangle and we have our circle. Okay, now the advantage of this is if I list line 40, because I've set line 40 to locate a pixel cursor position, I can come up here, I can change this, let's say to 100, and now instead of changing all of those values to modify that shape location, I can hit enter, I can hit run, and now everything is just reshaped relative to that pixel cursor location. So let's do one more, let's list 40 again, and let's go ahead and move it down to about 150, and we'll move it over to 140. And again, we can run, change that single line to modify the position of that entire shape. Along with basic 3.5 commands, there are also functions that are listed in the encyclopedia. Let's take a look at a couple of them, starting with this function right here. Now, it's important to note that you do have to print before you use the functions. And I'm going to type DC, which stands for decimal. And we are going to type a hexadecimal value here uh, enclosed in quotations and parentheses and watch what happens. It will return the decimal value of the hexadecimal unit. Very handy when you're programming or maybe looking at memory map registers, which we'll talk about later. Okay, this next function we're going to type is going to print out the position of certain characters within a larger string. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. Uh, first of all, I'm going to open that up. We're gonna do this. We're gonna type retro combs. Uh, my favorite text for today, and we'll close those quotations and we'll open up. And I want to know where that value or, or those characters are located within the larger retro combs area. So if I hit return now, you'll see it says five. Well, if I come over here and I move over five, one, two, three, four, five, position five right there, you'll see the OCO starts at position five. One, two, three, four, and five. So that's a way you can locate text within a larger string of text. 
Okay, this next one is the joy function. And I'm gonna go ahead and type this in. We're going to print joy, and we're gonna go from number one right here, and I'm going to hit the semicolon here, and we're gonna type 20 and go to 10. Now, before I do this, I am going to need a joystick. So I have here my handy dandy Hyperkin joystick, as you all know, and have seen that in many of my videos. I also, one of the things you'll notice is that this joystick has a nine pin, and let me put it under here, a nine pin den. Well, that won't do on the Commodore Plus 4 because it uses this weird connector. Now, thankfully, thanks to my buddy Jamie over at Jamie's Hack Shack, I do have this adapter right here. So what I'm gonna do is plug this into the back of the Commodore Plus 4. First, plug the, the joystick in like that, and then I'm gonna take that and plug it in the back. So I'll be right back. One of the biggest flaws in the Commodore Plus 4 is in fact that joystick port. Now, let's go ahead and run this program and see if, first of all, I plugged it into the right port. But what this is gonna do is return a value based on the location of your joystick. Where is it? Is it north, south, east, west, or northeast, for instance, or is the button press? So let's go ahead and you can see I'm already starting to get characters on the screen without even running it. So let's go ahead and run the program. And you'll see that that is running. If I hit up, up you'll see I'm at one. If I come down, you'll see my five. If I go right, three. If I go left, seven. If I hold the button, that's 128. Now, if I hold the button and go up, it'll take, should be 129, which the value north was one. And there we go. So if we exit the program by hitting run stop and we list it, then you can see the code one more time is here's that function joy one. Now, if we wanted to test the joystick on in port two, we just simply come over here and change that to two. Now kind of going back to our text and functions that look at text, let me come down here now and we're gonna do another function. I am going to print the len or the length of retro combs. How long is retro combs? How many characters is that? When we hit that, we'll have that it is 10. So another handy function there. All right, what if we wanna know how much memory we have left in our plus four? How much is available for basic programs? Luckily, we do have a function for that, and it looks like this. Now, the X is simply a placeholder, so you're gonna type the command just like this, and you'll see that we have this much memory. Now, it says 48353. Let's list, and you'll see that we still have our joystick program in. Let's new that. Let's come back up and see if we get a different value. And you see we do, we have freed up lines 10 and 20. So again, now we know how much memory we have left in our plus four for programming. Whew, that was a long section. Next sections are a lot shorter, including the next one, which is basic 3.5 abbreviations. Matter of fact, this whole section is devoted to making things shorter. That is basic commands. Let's take a look and see how those work. All right, section two is abbreviations. And we've looked at a lot of abbreviations. The first one that we've really been looking at is this directory abbreviation. So it's DI shift R is a way to quickly type directory and not have to type the entire things. And there's some rules, uh, although there are some commands that break rules that we'll talk about. So for instance, commands with two characters have no shortcuts. For instance, DO, the do command, would not have a shortcut. You wouldn't need to shortcut that. Commands with four letters or less are a combination of the first letter followed by shift and the second character. So for instance, the draw command is D shift R. That would be the abbreviation for draw. Commands with five or more characters such as directory are the first two letters followed by a shift and the third character. So again, D I shift R, and that's obviously a command that has more than five characters. Now, unfortunately, there are some commands that don't follow the rules. One of the most notable being D load, which is a simple D shift L. And we come over here and hit space, 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 get rid of that, and you'll see it loads. Now there is an oddity for one of the commands, or actually two of the commands, dload and dsave. Check this out. If I do dl, d 
the shift L rather, and I come over here and we get rid of the extra characters here and I hit enter, you'll see it's searching and it's working, which is very interesting. And if I come up here and hit DL shift O, guess what'll happen? Same thing. So there are some commands that don't necessarily follow the rules to their entirety. Uh, however, most of them do. So if you can start to work that in your muscle memory, that will work out well. Check out the entire table for all of the shortcuts and abbreviations you need though. Section three is entitled conversion programs. The whole point of this section is to help you convert programs from older Commodore machines to the more modern version 3.5 or from other systems, say a TI-994A, to the Commodore Plus 4. Let's take a look at a few of the tips and tricks they provide in this section. The only tip I found in section three that's valuable is this code for reprogramming all of the Plus 4 function keys to work as VIC-20 or Commodore 64 keys. Why? Because if I press function keys on the Plus 4, you know that they come pre-programmed with specific commands and you can see that here. So if I'm trying to convert a program from say the C64 or VIC-20, and those are active, and maybe those programs use function keys, then we're not gonna get the result we need. So there's a line of code in this section that lets us pretty much just clear those function keys. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. So this is the line of code, it says, for i equals one to eight, so that's gonna hit every single function key. You can see we have eight function keys down here. We're going to key i, which is the number of the function key that you see there. We're gonna change the character string to be i plus 132, which is a space, and then we're going to go next. So if we hit that and hit enter, you see nothing apparently happens, but watch when I hit my function keys. Nothing now is happening. It just doesn't work. And so again, that would be a valuable string of code to have if you are converting a program from another platform or an earlier Commodore computer. Throughout the programming journey, you're gonna make mistakes and the Commodore Plus 4 is gonna spit errors out at you. This section is all about explaining those errors, but there's a little tip in here. Let's take a look at that little tip. I'm going to print error, and I'm going to print the error no message number one, and we know that that is too many files. Now, what's useful about that, or kind of interesting, or could be even fun, I think, is, is if you come in here and you include that as part of a basic program. Now, if we list that right here, you can see it's 10 print the error message. If I run it, you see that we're going to get too many files. So what I've been able to do is print this long string of text by simply using this function and this value could be handy if you happen to just need to print too many values uh, or too many files as part of your basic programming. But think how much you, fun you could have if you're thinking about using this and maybe creating some kind of program where you're hacking uh, some kind of system and you get to print all these fun error messages. Uh, so you can use that table to help you find those. Could also be handy if you're trying to create a program that explains what error messages are to a new Commodore user. So there's an idea for you too. Now those error messages are for Commodore Basic. There's also disk operating system errors that you can print. And if I just do DS, you'll see I get a zero. That's the current disk operating system error. And you can go to the appendix in the encyclopedia and see what those are. There is also one called DS dollar sign, which is the actual error message itself. So if you had a message of, or an error on your disk operating system, you can display it using this and get that back. If you want to program an assembly language, this next section is for you. This is the TED Mon Monitor. It's kind of a mashup of TED, which is the chip that's inside the Plus 4 with Mon or Monitor, which is the assembly language monitor. Now, first of all, I am not a machine code guy. I should be, I should be doing more of it, but you know what? I know somebody who is, and I reached out to them and said, hey, can you give us a little help on understanding how the Tedmon works on the Commodore Plus 4? 
graciously, Robin over at 8-Bit Show and Tell said, sure, I'd be happy to help you. And he is the 8-Bit guru for me. Let me tell you, if you want to get a degree in 8-Bit computing, watch his channel. But for now, let's take a look at his channel and see what he's doing over on the Plus Four for the Tedmon. Take it away, Robin. Thanks, Stephen. Here on 8-Bit Show and Tell, we'll be looking at the commands for Tedmon, the machine language monitor that is built into the Plus Four. It allows us to examine and change the Plus Four's CPU registers, both view and modify memory, transfer, fill, hunt, and compare ranges of memory. Assemble or disassemble machine language programs and execute them. And save, load, and verify programs and data to disk or tape. And since Tedmon uses most of the same commands as monitors on other Commodore machines, such as Supermon or the Super Snapshot monitor, much of what you learn can be transferred across the entire Commodore 8-bit family. So if you're interested in looking in-depth at that with me, I'll see you over on my channel. Back to you, Stephen. Huge thanks to Robin over at 8-bit Show and Tell. I'm going to hit just a couple of quick things to let you use the Tedmon. If you're curious or just haven't had a chance to watch Robin's video yet, let's look at how to enter the TED monitor or the Tedmon. And it's as simple as typing monitor. Now, if you wanna see some additional code, we can type M and display portions of the monitor. And then simply to exit, we can type exit for exit. And that gets us out of the monitor and back into basic. <laughs> Section six is the screen display codes. What we're going to do now is take a look at how to address or display characters from the Petsky character set on the Commodore Plus 4. There's some really cool things here that we can do with these codes. Let's take a look. So this section allows us to use this table right here to poke characters to certain locations on the screen. Now we're gonna spend a little more time about the location piece, but first I wanna talk about how you can use poke to display these characters. Let's try a line of code. Let's poke 3072, and I want to display the letter A. Now, how, what, how do I know what A is? Well, if we look here, we find out that A is one. So at 3072, I'm going to poke one. Now, what is 3072? I mentioned uh, that we're going to spend more time in that a little bit later, so I'm not gonna highlight this too much, but, and it's a little difficult to see, but right there, the very upper left location is location 3072. If I go all the way to the right, we find out that that location is 3111. So I am asking the plus four to poke or put the letter A at position 3072. Let's go ahead and hit enter, and you'll see if I come up here, I now have an A in that position. If I want to move that down a little bit, let's say, uh, let's move it 10 characters to the right, and now it's not gonna move it, it's gonna put another one there. Hit enter, and you can see now we have it here and here. So that is how you can poke specific characters to specific locations. Now here's a fun little extra. If I come up here and I change the value from 128 to 129, watch what happens. You'll notice I get the reverse A. Any value that I have for a character, if I simply add 128, I get the reverse character. Now you'll notice that it is printing capital characters. Now I can hit Shift and the Commodore key to switch between those. Now, but how do you do that if you're in a basic program and need to switch between lowercase and uppercase? Well, there is a command for that, and it is simply print chr dollar. We're gonna open 
our parentheses and I'm going to type 14 and hit enter. Now when I do that, watch what happens. I've now switched to lowercase. If I want uppercase, I can come back up here and I can type 142 and that'll switch back. So this can become part of a command right here in a basic program to switch between upper and lower case. Very handy uh, for those basic programmers out there. All right, here's a little bonus. Here's a program I created that will display all of our characters for us. As the name suggests, it's going to print all the characters in uppercase. We will list the program and you can see the code here. If you want to take it and analyze it, feel free to do that. You'll notice here what I did was I did 127 plus 128. Those could, of course, be a combined value, but I did that because I want you to remember plus 128 for reverse characters because it's going to print reverse characters as well as our regular characters. And then I've got line 60. I've got a bunch of print statements that's simply going to move the cursor down after the program is running because when we use the poke, and character locations or screen positions, it doesn't remember that in print statement. So I had to manually move that down. So let's see what happens when we run this. And you can see our lines of code are printing. And there you go. Now, if you want to see the lowercase, uh, you'll notice that the code itself was in uppercase. Let's go ahead and change that to 14. And now we can run it again and you'll get a chance to see the same thing in lowercase. And of course I can switch back and forth by using the Commodore key and shift. So I just thought that was a fun program to include so that you could see the complete character set. Now, if you want to see what character is in a specific position, instead of poking, we can peek, we can take a look at it. So let's, let's do a command that says, print and let's peek at position 3072. Now we, we know that that should be a one, right? Because it's the letter A. Let's see what we get. And you see we get that. If we want to get the B, which is a number two, we change that to position three and you can see we have that. So the peek will allow us to peek into that position to find out what's there. Section seven is very similar to section six and it's entitled ASCII and character string codes. But instead of peeking and poking around on our Commodore Plus Four, we're gonna be printing around on our Commodore Plus Four. Let's learn how to use the character string function. So this is a great companion to our previous section as I stated. Let me show you an example here. Let's do ASC uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my parentheses, open my quotation marks, and I'm gonna close it. And uh, now I've, I've already got an error here, so let me go ahead and let's say, let's print that value. And what should that value be? Well, we know that the ASCII value for A is 65. It's not the same as the screen code values, but that is the ASCII value for the character A. And this is a great tool to use if you need to compare maybe a yes or no response from user input for a program. Another option we have, we know we can do, for instance, this command, we can hit control and turn on flashing in our print statement and then type something like retro and close that and that'll flash retro. Well, there's also another way to do that using character strings or character strings are ways that we can inject a line number that does the same thing as this keystroke right here that we just did. So let me show you how that works. Let's do print and let's do character string and for flashing text, that number value is 130. Uh, we need to put that in parentheses here. So let me go ahead and do that. And then we're going to put a semicolon. And then right after that, we're going to print retro again. And when we hit enter, you'll see we get exactly the same thing. So it's just another way to put these character codes on the screen without physically typing them. And if we look in the manual, you see that we have the entire Petsky character set that we can enter. And you'll see the set number here. You'll see the set two is here, so upper or lowercase. You'll see your poke value is here. 
So why might that be valuable? Well, I showed you how you could do uh, the replacement for the reverse, but what's also interesting is there are some in here that don't have an equivalent keystroke combination that you can work. So for instance, escape, if you need to inject and escape in your basic programming, you now have the character string code that you can use to do that. You can also do interesting things like disable your shift or your Commodore keys. You can inject a return key with 13. Uh, we showed you how to switch from lowercase to uppercase, uh, but then you could use your help, you can use black, but you can do all of these without having to use the keystrokes using simple code that may be just easier to do than trying to put the keystrokes in here. I will also say it also gives you the advantage of when you print out your code, especially on modern computers, these characters don't print out. So if you use a direct character string, you know that the program being typed is going to work as is. So there's just another reason why you might want to use these character strings. In section six, we learned how to place characters at specific locations around the screen using the poke command. We could also find the location using peek. Now what we're going to do is we're not just gonna place characters, we're gonna add color by using something called the screen color map. This chapter is all about location and colors for your characters. Let's take a look at how to use these two maps. We talked about the screen map just a little bit earlier. Right here, this is the screen memory wrap. Remember, oh, location 3072, we talked about that. Well, there's also colors associated with that particular map location. So here at 3072, we can address register 2048 and make that a specific color. Let's see what that looks like. Now we've poked a value uh, earlier of, uh, let's see, three. 3072, and we stuck a number one there, which gave us an A. You probably remember that, right? So, but now what I'm going to do is that along with poking that particular character, I am going to poke a color, and I'm going to poke at register 02048, a specific color. Now, what are the colors? Well, if we look here, we see that we have colors on this chart. So if I say at position 2048 on the color map, I want this to be red, then I know I need a position of, or a character of two. So I'm going to hit comma two, and let's see what happens. And you see that up here, we get a red A. Now it's looking a little brown, uh, but it is red, trust me, it is a red one. So let's do a different color that is highlighted maybe a little bit more. Let's do green, which is going to be five. And now you can see up here that that is green. So I poke the character that I want at the position, and then I poke the color map color at that location as well. Let's go back up here and change this to a two, make that red again. And uh, you're probably saying to yourself, uh, uh, can I make that flash? Well, yeah, you can make that flash by using your poke. And that's simply a matter of adding 128 to the color. So in this case, it'll be 130. We hit enter and now you see that we now have a flashing red A. Let's try another line of code here and play just a little bit more with the color value or the luminance of that value. I'm going to type poke and I'm gonna mix it up here. I'm gonna do 2048 first. I'm gonna do comma and then I'm gonna do two. And then what I'm going to do is just to make it a little bit easier for us, I'm going to do this and I'm gonna do six times 16. And then I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to poke at 3072, or that first position again, 3072, uh, we're gonna poke an A again. Now, let's come back here and take a look at what's happening here now. As you know, this is the, the color value register. This is the color we're looking for. So again, that's going to be red. That's the color we want. But what is the six times 16? So what we're doing here is we're gonna modify the luminance of this red two by modifying the luminance value, which is a value from zero to seven. In this case, I'm gonna choose six, which is gonna be a high luminance, not the highest, but almost. And I'm gonna multiply that by 16. And then what I want to do is I want to add that back into this. So I actually need to do this and add. So again, it's the color plus the luminance value times 16. 
Okay, this number does not change. This won't change. So let's see what happens when I type in this line of code. And you'll see that I get a pink up here now. So it's a really high luminance. So let's change that value to one, hit enter, and you'll see it gets a little bit darker. If I change it to zero, let's do that. And you'll see it's as dark as it can get. And then finally, let's do a value of seven. And that's how you can change the luminance of this value right here using your color and screen location map. I want to have some fun with this. So I created a program here that I like to call Character Rainbow. And the Character Rainbow is going to go through and it's going to print all of our characters and it's going to use our color and luminance variables to change as it prints the characters across the screen. The best way to describe it is just to run it. So let's do it. And as you can see, it's changing the luminance of the colors as it prints the pet ski characters. Again, this is not included in the user's guide. It's an extra for you on the companion disc for you to take and look at. It's a pretty easy program. It's pretty easy to understand. It's pretty easy to decipher. And I will leave that to you. Enjoy. I mentioned earlier that the Tedmon is a great way to peek and poke around inside and view the contents of your Commodore Plus 4 memory. Well, what we're gonna do now is use some of the commands from the Tedmon to kind of take a, that little look inside and find out what makes our Commodore Plus 4 tick or what are some fun things that even if you don't know assembly language, you can do using this memory map and the Tedmon. Let's take a look. So the first thing we need to do is enter the monitor. So we'll go ahead and type monitor. We learned that earlier. And then I'm going to type M, which is uh, going to display this memory location right here. Let's go ahead and hit return. And when I do that, I get some really interesting text over here. This is the beginning of Commodore Basic, that start screen that you see at the very beginning where it tells us what Commodore version of Basic we have and how many bytes we have free. So if you wanted to modify that, this is the location where you can do that. Now you may be looking at that going, I don't even know what that means. Well, you can also disassemble as we've learned those lines of code and you could come in here and start to take a look at that. Now, again, I am not the expert. I am just the messenger at this point having some fun. And there's another location that I think is pretty interesting, 818E. And this is gonna move us up a little bit. And this is the beginning of our basic commands. You can see here we have N for next, data input. That is where those are located. And again, if you kind of were curious about how all that was created, I guess we could disassemble that and start running through it. If I hit D again, go to the next line and just keep disassembling all the way down. Another one that I found interesting was this one, eight, four, six, E, Oop, not capital E, there we go. And this is all of those error messages. Remember all those error messages we were looking at in an earlier section? Here they are, right here. You can take a look at those. Okay, let's try and type in a program here. Okay, we have our program. I'm gonna go ahead and run that and we'll exit and run stop that. Now I'm gonna go into my monitor and then what I'm gonna do is go to position zone 008 and hit enter and let's see. And as you can see, there we have right there, this is that retro combs right here in that memory area location, which appears to be the beginning of basic memory. Don't quote me on that or correct me on that down in the comments below. But if we wanna disassemble that and see what that looks like, there we go. And uh, I, I'm looking here, now I'm not an expert, but I do see a jump here, uh, I'm wondering if that's the go-to loop. Again, I am not the, uh, the person to be asking, but hey, this is a great way to explore to see if you can start to figure out how all of this works. Let's go ahead and exit that. Section 10 is entitled Deriving Mathematical Functions. If you have a major in math, you don't need this section, move on. Use those chapter markers below and just move on. However, if you'd like to see how you can create another function from the provided functions, here's an example for you. So if we need to create or derive a mathematical function that's not available, there is, of course, this chart here that shows everything. And again, if you're a mathematician, you probably have all of this memorized. But just to give you a quick example of how that's going to work, I could easily come in here and I could say 10 is equal to the secant of x right here. Uh, and we'll do that. So what I'm doing is creating a function. Now, we talked all about functions in 
an earlier chapter, I believe it's chapter five. So be sure and check out chapter five if you wanna know all about functions. But basically what we're gonna do is create a secant using the built-in functions, which is one divided by the cosine of x, uh, old trig stuff there, and then you have it. So there is how you could recreate one of these functions in a basic program. So it's a very short section, but could be helpful if you are dealing with programming that has a lot of math. Section 11 is entitled Musical Note Table. Now I covered sound extensively in chapter eight. You can go back and even cover this table in brief form. However, let's go ahead and take a look at one more example and see what else this table can provide for you. We spent a lot of time in the musical notes, but let's just give you one more example to show you how you can use this table to help you create music on your plus four. So here is the table right here, and you'll see that we have a sound register value that correlates to the note and the actual frequency in Hertz. And as listed here, this is for NTSC. So that's important to note as well. I would assume that uh, manuals that went to Europe had a PAL representation of this table. Let's go ahead and take a look at a sample. And we've done, again, a lot of these. So I'm gonna type volume, we're going to do volume seven, and we are going to do sound, and we're gonna play one, seven, and 30. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is we are gonna play on sound channel one, seven, which is a note A for a half a second. So those are in milliseconds. So if we hit enter, if we wanted to go a little bit longer, then we can come up here and change this value. Oh, well, let's change it to 300. And you get the idea. I'm having a little problem with my capture. It's breaking up, but it should not stagger like that. It should be a continuous sound. However, if we want to change that up an octave, what I can do now is instead of seven, I can change that A to a five, one, six. And there we go. So that's how you can use the table to start to program musical notes, sounds, or songs. All right, section 12, we're getting there. And this is simply a listing of several programs that you can try. And just for you, I have typed every one of these into the plus four, and we're going to give them a shot. But remember, these are also on the companion disc image that's available at stephencombs.com slash plus four. Let's take a look at these sample programs and see what they do.
All right, we're coming near the end and we are on section 13, which is the RS-232 interface. Now, there's not a lot we can do with the RS-232 interface because I don't have an RS-232 printer or a modem that I can connect to a phone line. However, I did spend a lot of time connecting a modern Wi-Fi modem to a Commodore Plus 4. And if you go to stephencombs.com slash plus four, you'll also find the link there where you can find out how to connect your Commodore Plus 4 to a modern BBS via Telnet. However, there was some code in the manual. I did type it in. Let's see what happens. As I mentioned, I did type in the RS-232 program for you if you have a modem, but let's go ahead and take a look at it. So it's designed to open up the RS-232 port. Let's see what happens if we run it. Looks like it does. Now I'm anticipating an error because it's not connected to anything. And there we go. It is, there is an error injected there in line 370. Hmm. You know what, let's try that again with the Wi-Fi modem installed and see if we get a different result. Okay, I've got the RS-232 program loaded. I have the Wi-Fi modem installed. Let's run it again and see what might or may not occur. So the same kind of pause. We do have a prompt. Now let's see if we still get an error. And we still get an error, but the one thing that is different is we did get some kind of blip response. So probably modifying this program, we could access the Wi-Fi modem. So at least it's a start. Let me know if you find this useful for anything that you're working on though. Finally, the last section. Section 14, Books for Commodore Products. It's interesting that they include a list for Commodore products and very few specifically for the Commodore Plus 4, probably because there was a dearth of Commodore Plus 4 manuals when the user's guide was created. However, there are some gems in here and what I've done in the companion blog post is many of these are still available or you can get them as a free PDF. You wanna check out the companion blog post you'll find links to everything I could find online. Hey, if I've missed something and you know where there's a copy of one that I don't have linked, please send me a email at retrocombs at iCloud.com and let me know. So what do I think about the user's manual? Overall, not bad. I mean, it provides all the basic things that you need to get started. It's definitely not as fun as the VIC-20 user's guide, which had fun characters and cartoons in it, but it does an okay job. I will say I'm glad I went through it because this was a great time through the pandemic for me to verse myself and relearn again those Commodore commands I had forgotten, but with a more modern Commodore basic version 3.5. There's some great commands in here that would have really been nice on the VIC-20, but especially the Commodore 64. Important to note that this is not the only manual that comes with the Plus 4. There's also another one, this one, the Integrated Software Manual. Now, the decision I have to make is, do I really want to cover the integrated software? I don't know, I'll let you decide. Let me know if you think this is worthwhile, this is worth our time to go through the Integrated Software Manual page by painful page, or, as I've done with the encyclopedia, just kind of hit some highlights and move on. If you think that that would be a worthy use of our time together here at Retro Combs, make sure you leave that in the comments below or send me an email. Contact me in all the ways. Contact me on Twitter at Stephen Combs or be sure to visit my Buy Me A Coffee page where you can, if you really like this video, buy me a coffee. Hey, say, hey, I like it or become a member. We'd love to see you there. Plus, once you become a member, you can join the Discord. So check those levels to find out which level you need to join the Retrocombs Discord. So again, thanks to my current producers out there, names down below, and I will see you next time on Retrocombs. Retrocombs out. <laughs>